And as we prepare to think about the Word of God this morning, many of you may be familiar with what is called a Rube Goldberg device. Have you guys ever heard of this before? Maybe you've made one when you were in school, or at least you've probably seen one on the internet at some point. But basically, a Rube Goldberg device is a chain reaction machine. One small motion sets off a chain of events that then eventually goes on and the energy changes and transfers and amplifies to eventually achieve a simple goal. So in the example that you see on the screen, an alarm clock goes off, which shakes the table, which makes the rock fall onto the wheel, which then knocks over the cup, which pours the balls into the bucket, which pulls on the scissors to cut the rope, to release the shoe, to hit the staple and staple the stack of papers, which seems like a really complicated way to staple a stack of papers, but still, it's a pretty cool thing, right? That's what the Rube Goldberg machine is for. It illustrates a chain reaction in a really interesting way. And... I would say that we all know from experience that that's kind of how life often works as well. We think something, that thought leads us to act, and that act has consequences. Those things set off a chain reaction. Starting from a thought, it then leads to things, sometimes expected, sometimes unexpected, but other things happen as a result of eventually what we thought or believed, right? So as we continue our study of the book of Acts together, and as we've already seen throughout Paul's first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, there is a simple formula that we should notice, and that is this. The first blank on your sheet, if you're following along, is that belief leads to actions, and those actions have consequences. When we truly believe something thinking that it is true and important, the next natural step is for us to do something about it. And I would argue that if you say you believe something but never act on behalf of that belief, then you don't really believe that thing, right? If we really believe something, it leads to actions. But as every parent of a toddler teaches their children, your actions then have consequences, right? The things you do lead to other things. The things we do matter. They lead to outcomes, both positive and negative, expected and unexpected. Now, I know this is very basic and elementary, but it is worth considering. Our beliefs motivate our actions, which then lead to consequences, consequences that we should grow to expect. And sometimes the consequences of the actions that have sprung forth from a deep belief Sometimes those consequences are really difficult, really negative. Sometimes those consequences are suffering. Now, this is especially true when it comes to our belief in Christ. Consider for just a moment before we begin, Paul himself. He has been the focus of these last few chapters of Acts. And all the way back in Acts 9, we saw the story of Paul's conversion. Remember, everything changed all at once for Paul. God, or he encountered Jesus Christ, the real, risen, physical Jesus. Paul encountered him on the road, and everything that he had believed before was now thrown out the window, and he believed something new. And really, for Paul, the change was immediate. His actions then sprung from that new belief in the risen Jesus Christ, and he changed the course of his life entirely. In fact, it was such a startling change that people didn't know what to do with this guy. They were fearful of him because of the way he was before, and they didn't understand the way he was acting now. So as a result, as we saw back then, he got chased out of towns. And now as we enter into Acts chapter 14, once again, some years later, we have seen on display that his entire life, everything Paul does springs from his belief in the real risen Jesus. For Paul, as many of you know, to live is Christ. So as we have read in Acts chapter 13 and 14, along with Barnabas, Paul has gone off on a missionary journey. They have endured great risk because of their beliefs, doing whatever it takes to share the good news of Jesus with both Jews and Gentiles. And as a result, many people have believed Many disciples have been made. That's all the great and good consequences of their actions springing from their beliefs. But as we will see highlighted today, of all the consequences that follow his actions that have sprung from his belief, not all of them are positive. 
there are serious negative consequences, consequences that are about to catch up to Paul in a really big way. So as we begin this morning, I want to return to the passage that we ended with last week. I know we already read it once, but there's a couple things that I want to highlight from it that we didn't have time to cover last week. You'll remember, <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas had left Iconium and gone down, gone down to a city called Lystra. At Lystra, they encountered something new, and that was that it was a town with no synagogue. There was no Jewish presence there. There was no foundation for the knowledge of God or the prophecies that lead to Christ. This place was utterly pagan. So much so that when Paul and Barnabas work a miracle and heal a man, you'll remember from last week, that the people of Lystra start to worship them as if they are Zeus and Hermes. And Paul and Barnabas don't want this to happen at all. These people do not understand whatsoever. So Paul launches into this speech. Let's return to it together this morning. Look at Acts chapter 14, verses 15 to 18. Paul said, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. <clears throat> in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven in fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. Now, I return to this again because it is such a wonderful display of what it is that Paul believes, the beliefs that are driving his actions. Because understand, on a rational level, most people wouldn't even bother sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, with these people. They are so far gone. There is no foundation for understanding of who God is or what his law means or really what sin is. There's no understanding of that whatsoever. So most people encountering a community like this would say, they're too far away. This can't be done. They know nothing. Most people would think that there's no way that any of them could ever come to faith. However, Paul has this deep belief that springs from his own conversion. Think once again, Paul had the foundation. He knew the Jewish scriptures. He knew the law. He knew the prophecies. And still, he chose to hate Jesus Christ and his followers. Paul was a persecutor of the church until that all changed and in Paul's mind, if that conversion was possible for him, who though he knew God, hated the things of God, hated his son Jesus Christ, if he was able to convert Paul in that state, then surely that God must be able to save even these people that are also far from God. And in verses 17 to 18, Paul lays out a basic idea that will be fundamental moving forward for his ministry. And that idea is that even Gentiles who are far from God with no foundational knowledge of him or the Bible, of the scriptures, even those people know enough to turn to Jesus in repentance and faith. As Paul says in that passage, God did not leave himself without witness. In the natural world, these people had experienced what is called the general revelation and the common grace of God. He has revealed himself to them in the basic fabric of their reality and in their natural world. They have enjoyed, as he said, rains and fruitful seasons, good food and gladness. All of these things, Paul is saying, have come from God. You know enough to know that God has done something miraculous in your very existence. As Paul writes later in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, he kind of expounds on this idea saying this. He says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Even people like the people of Lystra who've worshipped false gods their entire lives and know nothing of the scriptures they know enough. God has revealed himself to them. He has made himself known, and they will be held to account. 
But just as God has made himself known to all people, God has also made salvation in Jesus Christ available to all people. That's Paul's message. That is his belief. Jew and Gentile, pious, religious person and pagan, those knowledgeable of God and those who have only ever known the world, all people are without excuse and all people need a savior. And all of them can find that salvation in the Son of God who sacrificed himself in order that we could be saved. That's what Paul believes. That belief is driving his actions, and those actions have consequences. You see, even as Paul is doing this, back in Pisidian Antioch, the city where he was before, and back in Iconium, there were those who hated this message. They hated the Jewish population, hated the message because it held them to a standard that they could not meet. It called them guilty. They also hated it because it brought Gentiles into the religion that they thought was only their own. They hated this message so much that they join with other people who aren't even Jews and they follow Paul's path. They leave Pisidian Antioch, they gather up more crowds at Iconium, and they go to find Paul and bring the consequences to his doorstep. So look with me now at Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to 20. It says, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Now, needless to say, these Jews were not pleased. They hate Paul's message. They hate that it involves their guilt. They hate that it includes the Gentiles. So they track him down. They gin up the crowds. And then just imagine this for a second. Imagine the the murderous intent that it takes to gather a crowd and say, pick up some rocks, see that guy. We're going to throw these at him until he dies. That's a brutal, violent thing to do, is it not? They threw rocks at Paul so much that they thought he was dead. Imagine how bloodied and beaten he must have looked for them to just assume he's got to be dead now, and they drag him out of the city. Now, when you read this passage, you may wonder, did Paul actually die? Is this an instance of God miraculously saving Paul's life? Is this a resurrection event for Paul? Well, in my opinion, I think we could differ on this, but my opinion is pretty much no. I don't think that's the case for a couple of reasons. First of all, Luke, the author of Acts, does make it clear that they supposed that he was dead. I don't think he would say that if Paul had been actually dead. It seems that he was beaten within an inch of his life, but still lived. They only supposed he was dead. And secondly, if it was a resurrection event, and there have been a couple of other ones in the book of Acts, Luke always makes a bigger deal about that. When God raises a person from the dead, that's a huge deal, right? And he doesn't seem to make a very big deal about it here. But regardless, Paul has taken a very serious beating because his enemies have attempted to murder him because of what he's done. Now, there's an interesting connection here also as we dwell on this incident with Paul, with him being stoned within an inch of his life. There's an interesting passage that comes up later in the New Testament that I think is worth us looking at this morning. Now, we don't know that this is a specific connection, but it is Paul saying something that seems to reflect what's happened here in his being stoned almost to death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers, and in this passage, he's really putting forth saying, I have no reason to boast in myself. But then he goes off on this little side tangent, speaking in the third person, but clearly about himself, and this is what he says. Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Now, again, this sounds like a near-death experience kind of thing. 
We've even heard similar stories to this of people who have gone through extreme physical trauma and have physically died for moments. They say that they have seen heaven, they've seen Jesus, they've heard things or seen things that they can't describe. This sounds very much like a near-death experience. And clearly, Paul at Lystra had a very near-death experience. So we may start to draw lines and say, is Paul talking about this event at Lystra? Now, the only hesitation here is that he says in that passage that it was 14 years before he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. That timeline does not quite add up with the time that we think that he was at Lystra. That would be before he was at Lystra. So either we've got our timing off and Paul's telling the truth that this really was the time that he was stoned at Lystra, or it's possible that this happened more than once to him. It's possible that he was beaten within an inch of his life more than once, and when he was, he saw a vision of paradise and heaven with Christ. He had two near-death experiences, possibly. Now, regardless if, he, if he's talking about the experience at Lystra or not, another similar one, we should take note of what Paul is experiencing in general, and that is his life since choosing to follow, follow Christ, since coming to belief in Jesus, his life has gotten by most standards, progressively worse. It is much harder than it was before. It is much more difficult. He nearly died. He is suffering. People are trying and very nearly succeeding at killing him. Paul has believed in Jesus and that has changed his actions dramatically, but those actions have consequences. He has enemies and he has suffered greatly because of his beliefs. And as hard as it is for us to digest at times, we should understand this to be the norm. Suffering will come for those who follow Jesus. So we should write this down on our sheets this morning. For followers of Jesus, suffering is a certainty. For followers of Jesus, suffering is a certainty. How much of the book of Acts do we have to read in order to realize that being a Christian is not all puppies and sunshine and rainbows. In the last few weeks alone, in the scriptures, we have seen very highlighted the risk, the danger, and the loss that believers experienced as they lived as gospel pioneers. We spent time last week talking about how the very message of the gospel itself is divisive. It causes strife and trouble. We've seen the words of Jesus play out in painful reality that you will be hated because of his name. <clears throat> so we simply can't ignore this fact. Suffering is not just a part of living on this earth. It is especially a part of living for the name of Jesus Christ. Expect it. Count on it. Suffering is a certainty. Now, I do feel like we should, we should make some distinctions here. In fact, if you were with us a year ago, back in November a year ago almost, we did a whole series called Suffering where we talked about this. Why do we suffer in this world? Why does this come upon us? So there's a couple of different categories. First of all, we suffer because we live in a, a world that's broken by sin. So that means that one of the ways that we suffer is that the world is just messed up. There are things like poverty and natural disasters and diseases and birth defects. Those are consequences of a world creation that is broken by sin. Secondly, we also suffer sometimes because of the sins of other people. People sin against us. They steal, they lie, they do mean things, and we suffer because of the sins of other people. Thirdly, we also suffer because of our own sin. We do bad things, and the bad things we do have negative consequences that cause us to suffer. Those are natural ways that we suffer in a sin-broken world. But then, there's another category of suffering when it comes to our biblical perspective of it. And that is suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. It is the kind of suffering that Jesus talked about when he told his disciples that they would be hated. They would be hated because of his name. That reality has not faded for us. We should understand that we will suffer because of our association <laughs> with Jesus, because we believe in him. Our sinful world is at odds with our sinless Savior. And if we truly believe in Jesus and seek to be obedient to Him, 
that changes our actions and the way that we live. And when we live for Jesus, there will be consequences. There will be suffering associated with that. Understand this on a, on a really practical level. As your belief in Jesus grows, you may find yourself, for example, questioning your career path. You may be challenged to begin to think, is this really what God wants me to do with my life? And if that does come up for you, you may suffer as you chew through the idea of whether or not you may have major financial loss in order to be obedient to what God would have you to do with your life and your career. That's a real way that you would suffer because of the name of Jesus. Or think of it this way. Another example would be friends that you have had since you were a child that are unbelieving friends. If you come to faith in Christ and suddenly this belief is motivating your actions, is changing the way that you think and the way that you live, the things that you do, suddenly you have less and less in common with those unbelieving friends. And if they're not responsive to the gospel, you might suffer the loss of those friendships. Or you could think of it in a really more practical way that you may have as you stand for Jesus in an increasingly divided culture, when you can no longer keep your mouth shut about injustices in the world and things that you see are clearly wrong with the way the sinful world works, and you begin as a person to choose to stand for what is right and true in Jesus Christ, there will be people that treat you as their enemy because they have sided with the sinful world and you have sided with the truth of Jesus Christ. You will have enemies and you will suffer because of that. Now, my hope and prayer is that you aren't taken out of town and stoned to death like Paul was. But even if you are, don't be surprised by this. Suffering is part of the game. It is a certainty it will happen. And clearly, Paul and Barnabas did not shy away from this suffering. Did you hear how remarkable the passage we just read is? Paul was almost dead. And then his disciples gathered around him and he stood up. And the next day, they went back to the city. He didn't even stop. He didn't even say, I, I, should, I should probably heal up a little while first. I should take a few days off to recover from, the, the, from this. No, Paul stood up and he wiped the blood off his face enough that he could see again as undoubtedly his eyes were swelling shut and he may have had teeth that were falling out. Who knows? They threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead and he still got up and said, all right, back to work. Let's do this. That is incredible. You can see on the map where he goes next, he goes down to a place called Derby. That's step number seven on the map of this missionary journey of Paul, just a short ways down to the southeast. That's where he's headed next. He has work to do. There are people there that need to hear the gospel. And it goes on to say this in verses 21 to 23. It says, when they had preached the gospel to that city, Derby, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, we don't get a very good sense here in Luke's description of how long this took. But clearly, Paul and Barnabas got right down to business in Derby. They raised up many believers. They discipled them. That's an amazing level of dedication there. They knew that their beliefs and actions had consequences. But at this point, they're just rolling with the consequences. He just lived through stoning. So what else can the world throw at him? He's going to keep going. He's going to keep doing this. In fact, they're so emboldened that they actually return to Iconium and Antioch the very places where the people had come from to come and stone him to death. They walk back into those same cities where their murderers lived, and they go there to encourage the disciples that they had made there before. Now, take just a moment to appreciate the absolute guts that it takes to walk back into a place like that. They know they're going to be spotted. The word's going to spread. The people who tried to kill them are there, but that's not going to stop them. It's as if Paul walks into the city, says, 
Is that all you got? You think stoning me to death is going to stop me? No, I'm here to do a mission that I've received from God. I believe this. I'm going to act on it, and I don't care about the consequences. You see, in my day, believe it or not, I've done a lot of dangerous things. In fact, it's one of my favorite things to do is to do things that are a little bit too dangerous that I probably shouldn't do. And over time, I had a little bit of a reputation, at least with my family, who's very cautious, to be the dangerous one in the family. And part of the reason I do that is because I like the stories of harrowing events. I like the way that feels to tell a really cool story. And for that reason, I am sometimes, admittedly, the person who encourages other people to do dangerous things because it's going to be a really cool story, right? I just like that. And for that reason, a couple years ago at Christmas, my mom got me a t-shirt that says this. It says, but did you die? Because that's kind of my attitude with things. Like, I do these cool, dangerous things, and it's like, that was a really cool story because I didn't die, right? We made it through it, but did you die? Then it's a cool story. Congratulations, you've done something amazing. Now, imagine this with me. (laughs) Imagine Paul walking back through Iconium and, and Antioch up in those cities and these other believers that have lived there among these people that hate what Paul stood for. These believers come up to Paul and say, Paul, this has been really hard. We've really struggled here. These people hate our message. They hate us. They, they, are, they don't like us. They're being really mean to us. And imagine Paul just handing out these t-shirts. But did you die though? Did you die? Because I kind of did when they stoned me back there. I was pretty much dead. And if you didn't die, then get back to work. That's the message that Paul is spreading as he goes back to these cities where people are being persecuted because of their faith. You didn't die, so keep going. But in all seriousness, Paul does encourage these young believers to just continue in the faith. And look at what Luke describes that Paul says in his encouragement in verse 22. Paul says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God of God. Yes, for Christians, suffering is a certainty. It is going to happen. If you deeply believe in Jesus and live accordingly, consequences and suffering will come. But what is the end result? We enter the kingdom of heaven. In this, we see the next thing that we should understand from all of this, and that is for followers of Jesus, suffering is temporary. Suffering is temporary. Yes, there will be very real, very painful consequences to our belief in Jesus. But the pain we experience now will not last forever. Instead, because our eternity is made secure in Christ, we are looking forward to a permanent kingdom in which there will be no more suffering, no more pain. The things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's what we have to look forward to. There's an author named Randy Alcorn who puts it like this. He says, for Christians, this present life is the closest they will come to hell. For unbelievers, it's the closest they will come to heaven. That's the truth that we cling to. All that you suffer here on earth, if you have repented of your sins and trusted in the finished work of Christ, this is the closest you will ever get to hell. All that awaits you is so much better than this earth. Your suffering is temporary. This is the way that Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Friends, right now, if you were suffering in any way in this life, but especially if you are suffering for the name of Jesus Christ, do not lose heart. 
be encouraged that in Christ, you are being renewed day by day. All of this suffering and affliction is preparing for you a greater reward, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. All of this pain is transient. Now, it may not feel like that when you're in the middle of it, but your suffering will one day cease. It will end. All of this sin-broken world, all of it will pass away and all of its suffering with it, and it will all be replaced and restored and redeemed by the kingdom of God. And for those who believe in Jesus, who stand firm to the end, we have this great reward. Our Savior Jesus Christ will wipe away every tear. There will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow. The suffering of this earth will end. But His kingdom will never end. Your suffering is temporary. Look back at Acts chapter 14, verses 24 to 28. This is how Paul and Barnabas bring their first missionary journey to an end. It says, Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. So you can look once more for one last time at the journey of their first missionary journey here. Step eight is a little bit deceiving because they didn't want to overlap it over the words, but as we just read, they did return to Iconium and then Antioch and then down to Perga and Italia before sailing all the way back to the Antioch that they came from. That's a long journey, and they spent very much time going through these places, and as it just added, it doesn't give us any details, but it says that when they went back through Perga and Italia, they continued to preach the Word of God. Now, it's a pretty good chance that when they passed through the first time, they didn't take the time to do that, but here on their way home, they want no stone left unturned. They share the gospel even in those places as well. And then they make their journey home. Remember, they had departed with the blessing of the believers at Antioch. But we can be sure, once they finally returned back there, that it was a joyous celebration, a great occasion. They had been sorely missed by the dear believers at this place in Antioch. And when they returned, there must have been much celebration, and they must have felt so much comfort as they're welcomed by trustworthy, loving, dear friends in Antioch. And I think we would be right to imagine that when they got back, they probably looked a little worse for wear. Now, we don't know for sure how Paul looked at this moment, but church history does indicate that he wasn't a very good-looking guy in the first place. We're told that he's short and bald and kind of stocky, but now he comes home back to Antioch, and he looks worse. He had been stoned until he thought he was dead. As I said, he is looking worse beat up. And if he had returned in that fashion to a church in the south of the United States, they would have welcomed him, but said, bless your heart. That's how Southerners say, What's, what happened to you? <laughs> what happened on your journey? How did you end up like this? You can imagine people literally asking Paul and Barnabas when they got back, welcome back. Are you okay? What happened to you? What happened to your face? Why are you walking like that? How bad was it out there for you guys? But instead of telling the tales of all their troubles and trials, what did Paul and Barnabas do? They gathered up the church, and it says in verse 27, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Hear this. They didn't say, oh, poor us. You wouldn't believe how hard it was. You wouldn't believe what we've been through. They didn't say, you won't believe how hard it was and how mean people were to us. Instead, no, their message was, you won't believe what God has done through our suffering. You won't believe what God has accomplished even despite all of the scrapes and bruises, the scars, the missing teeth, the aches and pains. 
None of that matters because God was accomplishing something amazing and bringing faith to the Gentiles. And in that, we see one more important point, and that is that for followers of Jesus, suffering is purposeful. It's purposeful. It's leading to something. It means something. It is accomplishing something in you. Your suffering, especially your suffering for the name of Jesus, is for a purpose. The one in whom you believe, who changes your actions and calls you to obedience, the one for whom we do suffer consequences, he is working through all of it in order to accomplish his good and perfect will. He is doing something so good, even in the midst of our pain. Think of the passage from Romans that we opened our service with today. Paul said in Romans 5, verses 3 to 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do you see what Paul has grown to understand here? His suffering, which, let's be honest, is far greater than any of the suffering that any of us have endured. All of it was for a purpose. His suffering on his first missionary journey produced endurance in him. He had lived through some really terrible stuff. But you know what? Now he knows that he can live through it. He has built up endurance. It produced endurance in him. And that endurance produced in him character. If what hasn't killed him made him stronger, then there must be a strength that comes from outside of him. And that knowledge of what Jesus is doing and helping him to endure means that he says, Jesus is developing this character in me. He's galvanizing my belief. He's solidifying me in what I know to be true. I may have had consequences that came from my actions, that sprung from my belief, but it's really just built up the strength of what I believe. I have a deeper, stronger character because of the consequences. Now, even more than that, he says that that character that has been built produces in him hope. If God has done all this, if God has encouraged me and built endurance in me and developed character in me, even through the worst things that I've been through, then I know that I have a hope for the future. If he's working even in this, think of the work that he'll continue to do when he redeems and restores this world. I have a hope that will not put me to shame. Now, many of us would think that if we looked like Paul after this first missionary journey, with bruises and scars and missing teeth or whatever, we might think that we might feel ashamed for that. But Paul says, no, this has produced in me a hope that does not put me to shame. This produces in me a hope that is beyond even my suffering in this mortal body. This proves for me who God is in me and for me. So then the hope is for us to be able to see our suffering in the same way. How beautiful would it be if you could gather the church together after going through the very worst time of your life and instead of gathering them together to say, oh, poor me, this hurt me so much, this was so hard, I can't believe that God did this to me. What if instead of saying that, you were able to say, after the very worst suffering of your life, look at what God has done, even in the midst of my suffering. Look at how he has encouraged me and built up endurance in me, given me character, who has given me this proven hope for the future. Look at what God has done in opening a door for me to serve someone else when they go through a similar hard time. Look at how God is able to redeem even the very worst of what I suffer on this earth. That's the kind of character that I hope that we can have. And truly, I don't wish for you to suffer. I know that you will suffer. And what I wish is for the church to gather together and to say, even in the midst of suffering, look at what God has done. It was for a purpose. 
It was temporary. We look forward to a time in heaven where we just celebrate that God rescues us from suffering and builds us into something better. If we truly believe in Jesus and his power to save, it will set off a chain reaction. Our belief in him will motivate and change our actions, and as we act according to his will, there will be consequences. Suffering will come. It is a certainty. But we have a hope that is beyond this world, and we can know that our suffering will not last forever. But what is even more remarkable is that our suffering, like Paul's, can produce something good and serve as a testimony of who our God is. So we can rely on and trust in our Lord and Savior, even in the midst of our suffering. Let's pray as we finish for today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful truth. Even as much as we may fear the suffering that will come, even as much as that produces in us a sense of dread in the moment, or for those of us who are suffering even now, that we have sorrow because of it. God, even in the midst of all of those feelings, help us to see that you are a God who is able not only to relieve us of our suffering, but to use it to produce something good. And I pray for all those in this room who take chances and take risks, whose actions are motivated by their beliefs. I pray that when the consequences for that come, that we will stand firm to the end, that we will hold fast to Jesus Christ, knowing that he is the ultimate victor over all these things. And God, for those who are suffering just for living in a sin-broken world, I pray for peace, and I pray that it will produce in them endurance and character and hope that is unshakable. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together as we close.